welcome to the Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And with Mike. And together, we are rereading our favourite series of novels. That, of course, is the Aubrey Maturin novels of author Patrick O'Brien. Mike, we're getting quite a long way on in our journey, aren't we? Tell us, please, just how far we got last week and what steps we might make this week. Oh, I'd be delighted to, Ian. Last week in Chapter 6, Henry Wantage, master's mate, died and was put over the side. The surprise was stuck in the doldrums with the USS Delaware. And Jack told Stephen about Sir David Lindsay's past deadly and temperamental character. This time in Chapter 7, in Rio, Jack learns about the Asp, Lindsay's you know, remodeling ship, before leaving to go around the horn. Stephen's serial letter to Christine continues. There's a nod to O'Brien's first two nautical books, Brushes with Brutal Weather and Seas, Women Up to the Challenge, and Men Working Hard as Supplies Run Short. Wow, Mike. Uh, it's exciting that we're starting in Rio, right? I can't, I can't wait for the Copacabana. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They've been so long trying to get to South America. Finally, we're making landfall in actual South America. We're on the Atlantic coast, which is not the coast they were aiming for, but you know, we're, we're on the way. This is also the point where they start to be able to make contact with intelligence sources on the land here. Coming into Rio then, Jack invites Stephen up into the main top to view all the activity that's going on in the port. Jack gets some help for Stephen from Mr. Midshipman slash master's mate Hanson, so that Stephen's got some hand and footholds to keep him steady as he gets aloft there. R really nice, as always, to have Hanson with us. Another little sign that as a first voyager, he's now a mature part of the ship's company. Great that he's doing a little kindness for Stephen as well. So this is all great, and we're starting to see what could be happening in Rio. Of course, we're on the lookout for a ship or ships connected to this rival, Sir David Lindsay. At breakfast, Jack asks Stephen whether Dr. Jacob, with his Portuguese, might be able to go into Rio along with William Reed to find out discreetly about the ASP. That's the ship that's sailing along with, uh, with Lindsay aboard. They, they can do this as the Ringle goes in for water and supplies, but without drawing attention to the fact that we have a whole frigate-sized other UK vessel here. Stephen says, well, why don't we just have Jacob appear to be an idle passenger walking around to see some of the sights of Brazil? And this seems like a great idea. And Mike, th this conversation's going so well, and then Killick comes in <laughs> to share some bad news. And I'm, I can't remember. I, I think Killick's been kind of on the up for a couple of chapters, but that means he's due to come in and strike a bit of a sour note. So the African cats, he said, that they took aboard in Sierra Leone, have eaten or spoiled all of their mangoes, and Killick's tone seems to be, I mean, cats, I told you they'd be trouble. And maybe, Mike, it's just that Killick really relishes being the one who delivers bad news. Anyway, Reed, meanwhile, gets to tell Jack that Jacob's lack of understanding and the complexities of Portuguese nautical terms together make it impossible to learn enough about the ASP to satisfy Captain Aubrey's inquiries. So he says, we could try to make arrangements for water and stores, but the rest of the mission, he means the intelligence part of the mission ashore, is a fool's errand. You might as well, he says, you might as well try to shave with a butter knife. That's a pretty Ooh. downbeat assessment there, Mike. It really is. Oh, but interestingly, Jacob proves Reed wrong. When they return, Jacob's got these beautiful exact drawings of the almost entirely rebuilt ASP and these drawings that, you know, in such great detail, along with Reed's technical descriptions, tell Jack everything he needs to know. Now, Jack's looking over this new ASP. She's much longer uh, she's got more gun ports aside, and Jack wonders if she'll be as windwardly as she was before. He points out that was her one good point before. Reed describes some of her new armaments, including a most elegant pair of brass chasers right front, and Jack's ordinarily cheerful face grew, according to the text, graver still. Well, 
So Jack apparently, you know, is thinking he kind of written off the ass, but now it's like, <sighs> okay, not, not as good as I wanted. And it sounds like maybe things aren't going great around the rest of the ship either. No, and by, by the way, I'm, I'm remembering the little hint of jeopardy at the end of the previous chapter when we learned that Lindsay's kind of physically courageous and speaks Spanish. Now it right, turns out that right. he's got a reasonably well fettled ship here. So, having had this fresh perspective on the ASP and just how capable she might be, we go back into the world of Stephen's serial letter. And uh, Mike, I've had the impression in these couple of chapters that we're working on right now that we're getting quite a lot of Stephen. O'Brien's enjoying spending time, I think, behind the eyes of Stephen Maturin. So we are here in the midst of this long serial letter to Christine Wood. And he's talking about this sense of almost universal concern, as he calls it, the universal tension that he sees aboard the ship. Everyone except for the midshipman's birth and the ship's boys, so everybody who has any maturity, you might say, has what Stephen calls a want of cheer of those conventional jokes, semi-insults, and jocular repartees that make up so much of the very small change in shipboard life. And I think it's a good observation of what they lack. There are lots of closed societies, especially aboard ship, where you get this kind of jokey repartee, but he's noticing that it's not there. At first, he thought that it might be because they're sort of caught in between winter and spring, and they're seeing not very many birds and other creatures. I think, Mike, that's Stephen writing off the world as, you know, in, in, in terms that make sense to Stephen Maturin and not to anybody else. He realizes that perspective is a little bit irrational. It's more likely, he thinks, due to the general knowledge aboard that they are due to go around the horn and make this really perilous journey from the Atlantic into the Pacific. And they're going to go around the outside, around Cape Horn, rather than through Magellan Strait. Jack, we understand, dislikes using the strait when sailing from east to west because of the perilous maneuvers, because it's a very narrow waterway, and in a strong westerly blow, you can run out of options. So it seems like we've got the crew sort of second-guessing Jack's navigation skills a little bit here, and certainly second-guessing whether they are up to this perilous journey around the horn. Yeah. And, and Stephen continues to write to Christine about the influence that a captain has on his ship. So there's this sense of concern. And I think Stephen's starting to tie it back to Jack a little mm. bit, saying this captain's influence is especially strong when the captain has commanded her and her officers and crew for many years. And the text says his expression, his daily mood, his tone of voice are naturally, automatically, and universally observed, not out of curiosity or intense personal interest, but as any man, sailor, farmer, fisherman, subject to the weather, frequently looks at the sky. This is one of these highlighted over and over again in my books here. I love this analogy and uh, this idea about how the crew thinks about their captain and how the ship is dependent on a captain like a, a sailor, a farmer, or a fisherman are dependent on the weather. And we're going to have lots of weather <laughs> in this rounding. So oh, it's also true. And I couldn't help but wonder to myself, we'd heard a little bit about Lindsay before. We, of course, heard about Jack for 20 books now. And yeah. I, I would say, get out your lover's whole bingo card. Let's stick a pin in this and keep coming back to the influence of different captains on their yeah. ship here. I think we're going to play that a little bit. And Stephen is telling Christine something that sort of surprised me a little bit. He says that he's only subject to Jack's etat dumb as a friend, but even he finds himself curiously affected. Now, this this phrase that Stephen's using the French here literally means sort of state of mind, sometimes used for moods or qualms or conscience or convictions yeah. or other states of mind in context. Some translators even translated as state of the soul. So I think it's kind of like, okay, I don't, have to look at Jack like all the other sailors here do. You know, I'm, I'm his friend, but he says he still finds yeah. himself curiously affected. Uh, and he goes on to say, how ardently I hope that my note may reach you in Dorsetshire, bearing as it does more affection than is ordinarily enclosed in a common sailcloth cover. So within a paragraph, I've got these two great lines. I, you know, I love... Stephen's heart so open to Christine here yeah. and, you know, us kind of moving on past Diana. I don't think having forgotten Diana at all, but 
the, yeah. the possibilities for tomorrow. In a lot of this book, things don't seem to go well. And then there are also kind of dawns on the horizon. So fascinating for me. Yeah. And, and maybe it's another little arm's length reflection on bereavement for, for O'Brien. He's noticing that just being in proximity with somebody in the relationship of a friend, you get emotionally in sync with them a little bit. And I'm sure it's deliberate that that thought is juxtaposed with the thought that he'd like to be close to Christine. Like he'd like to be emotionally in sync with somebody who's his, who's his companion, not just his, uh, his dear friend. And that's a really touching thought that he's exploring all the different ways that he misses Mary, I guess. Yeah. Well put. Yeah. Well put. Wow. Several days of writing are going into this great long serial letter to the extent that we now see different pen and different ink and a discolored piece of paper because there has been some weather. Stephen writes about how many of the pages have been lost in one intemperate gust that they've been washed with seawater and ice. He says, while poor surprise lay on her beam ends on one of the innumerable uncharted reefs on this forbidding part of the world. And Mike, at first I'm reading that going, really? Were we really aground? And let's read on about what Stephen's talking about here. Stephen and Paul Skeeping have been attending to some hands who'd in, been injured by a gun thrown from its breachings by the furious thrust of ice. So I think what Stephen's describing as a reef, which would be kind of a game over, I think, as far as a ship round the horn is concerned, they might actually have grounded upon a piece of floating ice. Still doesn't sound the safest thing in the world but he kind of explains why they're still floating. Stephen goes on and recounts some of what he had originally shared with her in these pages that got lost. He was keeping a daily diary of the birds and the wildlife that he'd seen. And he had once again gone back to his low-key insecurity about where he stands in these letters because he gives this apology for addressing her in a familiar style, a style that he says, I justified by the fact that as I was not an absolutely and formally rejected suitor, such a degree of ease could be considered permissible, although perhaps blameworthy, even indelicate. And poor guy, he still thinks there are some eggshells that he needs to tread on here. <laughs> I don't know quite why he's kind of hanging on to this idea. He's been pretty open with her about his thoughts, so far at least. The missing pages that he had been talking about had also described a particular landmark that the ship had got to. He described the ship as coming up to the Cape of 11,000 Virgins just before the mouth of Magellan Strait. And he described how all the crew had stood watching the strait go by, most with a face as grave as their captains. No remarks of any kind. The silence broken only by the regular stroke of the bell. And I'm sure, of course to the crew this is them sailing past this probably calm sheltered looking inlet thinking we could go that way but the skipper's taking us around the outside is that going to be our last glimpse ever of safe dry land or ah, what are we letting ourselves in for here anyway mike while the hands are contemplating what might have been with the voyage down the straits of magellan we're contemplating as well this place the cape of the eleven thousand virgins that that seems quite a lot of virgins to have in one place Useful the virgins, no doubt, are right. <laughs> yeah, I I was t really taken by this. You know, I was like eleven thousand virgins. So I had to dig in here a little bit, and it turns out this this absolute this cape on the southeast tip of Argentina, Magellan reached it on twenty first October fifteen twenty, and the twenty first of October used to be, in the in the grand Catholic scheme of things, the feast day of St. Ursula and the 11,000 virgins, and okay. you know, named in her honor. You know, St. Ursula, the little female bear, is a, a Roman-slash-British saint said to have traveled from Britain to Rome and been martyred along the way, al along with her 11,000 accompanying virgins by Huns, that they refused to have sex with in Cologne, Germany. And this was all new to me. And then I, I read on to find out that, in fact, Christopher Columbus had named the Virgin Islands in her honor in 1493. Oh. So, you know, this is 
a story that's made its rounds. You know, we might be able to share on social media a picture of the bones, supposedly, of these virgins in the Basilica there in Cologne. Wow. Uh, and it's it's a story that is fascinating. So I thought, well, O'Brien could have just picked it out because yeah. it's a, you know, it is, in fact, a piece of, of geography right on here. But it's also a story that if you look in the history, kind of started with somebody else, not St. Ursula. It yeah. got elaborated, you know, it was hundreds of years later and it grew and then Ursula became part of it. And it was perhaps a virgin, perhaps 11 virgins, perhaps 11,000. There are all sorts of theories about how this became there to the point where it was eventually kind of taken off of the main calendar of, of feast days because there's just so much uncertainty there. And it it stood in for me to say, ah, the crew thinking about all the certainty of that straight and ah, things, yeah. you know, things never go quite the way you think they will. Ursula in the, in, you know, kind of the later stories leaving from Britain to go become married, who is going to stop, not when she first arrives in Europe, then return and be married and is, you know, martyred along the way. Mm. But so it's like, okay, crew, you know, this, this spot here might not be as safe as you think it is and doing what you think is the right thing. And I also couldn't help but think about Stephen writing to Christine, this whole thing about her sexuality, as we've talked about yeah. before, <laughs> virgins who are not virgins, who might be virgin, who, you know, are, or, you know, all of this, I don't know. I just thought it's just, I, I wonder if O'Brien does this like we do breathing. You know, yeah. these things just come yeah. and magically, you know, put so much into a story, what, you know, whether he actually meant them or how he meant them to be or not. So fascinating. Right. We had a little while ago the reflection that he, he himself had once said kind of later on in his life, how do you do all this? He said, well, I have done all the research. And it was in the past tense, like all, all the connections, all the synapses were there and they come out in whatever order he chooses to bring them out. When he's writing, I'm guessing now we're at very, very late in his life, and he must be just roaming in the palace of his kind of memories and insights and bits of arcane knowledge, and just surfacing these things. And we might never—well, we do never know, right? Yeah. Anyhow, so much for the virgins. We're about to get in deeper and deeper into really, really bad weather, and. We've described this foul weather really, really dramatically in the chapter here, I think. There's far more ice than is usual for this patch of water for this time of year. There are occasional great ice mountains. And I love the fact that he calls them ice mountains and not icebergs because iceberg was a word invented much, much later in history. Some of these ice mountains are beautiful green, blue, or turquoise in color with the continuous winds and the monstrous waves. Despite all of that, they're maybe as tall as 100 feet tall with these waves breaking against these beautiful tall masses of ice. And now they're on an even keel again. They're fighting against these really vast waves, fighting against mostly adverse winds under what is called the sometimes astonishingly complete lee of the many, many islands. And it is a very bizarre feeling when you're in a gale and then all of a sudden you find yourself in the in the wind shadow and it's like you walked into a vacuum and then you're back out again into the wind a, a few moments later. They do get the chance then to give themselves some rest. They pull into a sheltered bay. They try to rest in the lee of this uh, island here to fight against the weather and also to pick up fresh food, fish and mussels because... They have the ongoing risk here being so far from their last resupply. They have the ongoing risk that the quality of their provisions is going to go down. Stick what you might call a pin in that idea just for now. Stephen goes on telling Christine, he's, he's sort of rambling about this area and rambling about everything. And he tells Christine that Jack had known this Admiral Byron and family as a boy and Byron himself, when he was a midshipman, had sailed in the unfortunate wager, one of the squadron with which Anson made his famous circumnavigation. Ah, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quick grab a pin in that one because Anson's circumnavigation is the basis of O'Brien's first nautical fiction, The Golden Ocean, published in 56. And his second book of nautical fiction, The Unknown Shore, published in 59, focused specifically on the wager, you know, one of these ships in Anson's squadron. Yeah. So 
I've come back. The text says, you know, the wager was wrecked in the Kronos archipelago and Byron and his shipmates lived very hard among the Indians of these parts. And this sets up a little bit of a theme of this chapter, the Indians of the part here. But I couldn't help, Ian, as, as we've been you know, contemplating over how do we wind up the lover's hole, that this was O'Brien's little way of letting us know that right. perhaps we really do need to go back and take a look at these precursors to the Aubrey Matron series, as, as so many of our listeners have suggested. And Indeed. We hope to do that. Couldn't agree more. And interestingly, if you listen to this in the kind of fall and winter of 2023, this is also the moment when there's a lot of interest in a book by David Grant called The Wager. And lots yes. of you on social media have talked about having read this book. Um, it's I've heard various rumors that it might be you know, getting made into a film. It might even get made into a movie before the alleged reboot of the Patrick O'Brien series. We'll, we'll never know. But there's a lot of interest in The Wager. And it was clearly, from what everybody says about the book, I haven't read it yet, but from what everybody says about the book, it was a pretty grim time that they had, um, not only because it was a long time ago, but also because they had it really, really hard. Right. Anyhow, Stephen's still here with this ongoing letter to Christine, and he's reflecting on what he knows about Byron's time spent living with the local Indians. He tells Christine that the women of these tribes were kind to Byron. They did practically all of the work. They handled the canoes. They could swim, but the men of their tribe could not. Women did the fishing, laid out the nets, trained dogs to drive fish into the nets. They cooked. The women of this tribe made what little clothing everybody wore. If they wore clothes at all, it was quite often just a little piece of seal skin, as the phrase goes, kept to windward. And in this description, in the story of Byron's voyage here, the men walked about on the strand, gathered fuel, sometimes hunted, albeit with little success, but did make daily fires even when everything was wet and they used to pass smoke signals at a considerable distance. <laughs> And I think there's, a, there's at least half a wry smile between this contrast between the absolutely thoroughly resourceful, self-reliant, leading foundational skills and, and roles of the women and the rather trivial, pointless, kind of half-assed skills of the men in his tribe. And you know, not, not a surprise that O'Brien once again is taking us back to the women's role and, uh, and what might be missing in the patriarchy. Right, right. Too true. <laughs> well, Mike, it, it, it's probably time for us all to take a moment or two to ponder our, our own position in the patriarchy. Um, you and me, no less than anybody else. So right. um, why don't we all take a moment to go and grab a glass of something non-patriarchal and we'll be right back with you all after this short break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the break. It's worth taking a moment now to remind you that there's still time to get your lover's whole merchandise before the holidays, assuming that you listen to this in December 2023. The merch store has coffee mugs, hats, t-shirts, all kinds of tat, phone cases, drinks, coasters. Thanks to the wonders of digital marketing and printing on demand, there are loads of choices for you there. If you'd like a little something to celebrate your time as a listener of The Lover's Hole, uh, feel free to go check it out. It's on lovershole.redbubble.com. Those details will be in our social media channels at various times as you're listening to this as well. If you do pick up something, tell us on Facebook or on Twitter what you think of your gifts. We hope that you're enjoying the experience and uh, we'll, we'll keep that up for a little while so you can all um, enjoy that if that's what you want to do. Anyway, Mike, that's the retail therapy done with. Uh, we, we've got other kinds of therapy <laughs> going on here aboard the surprise, right? Right, right. Well, we've got, you know, it's 8 a.m. It's time for Stephen to start his rounds as usual. And as he comes in, he sees Hansen visiting a member of his division. This gentleman, Bjorn, is a Swedish whaler who's now got three broken ribs from a recent blow. And Stephen, the text says, addresses Bjorn in that what the text calls that rather loud, distinctive voice that even quite intelligent medical men use for their foreign patients. And he's telling Bjorn, you know, 
if Mr. Hansen provides a shipmate <laughs> to make sure Bjorn doesn't fall, that he can go up on the deck since it's calm now. And I, I, I thought this was kind of cute that, you know, we've, we've heard this several times in the canon before. Now, even Stephen is, uh, is talking this way here to Bjorn. Well, at breakfast, Stephen's reflecting back on this and telling Jack how very pleasant it is to see these young men taking care of the hands in their division. And Jack kind of, I think, reacts very differently than Stephen expects. Jack says, the text reads, it'd be a damned odd unhappy ship, were they not, said Jack. There's no right feeling where officers do not feel a real concern for their men. If you were to serve in other ships, I think you would find it much the same throughout the service. And I love it. O'Brien writes, <laughs> Stephen did not wholly agree, but he said nothing. And I think this is another one of those. This is the way Jack thinks the whole world is. Yes. But we know <laughs> from the canon and Stephen knows that, no, this is the way Jack is. And this is the kind of ship that Jack runs. It's it's such a great piece of the optimistic undercurrent of Jack's personality. Like he's pretty sure he suspects that the whole of the rest of the world is like it is in a well-ordered Navy. And even if it's not true, he hopes that it soon will be. It's like the whole world is just waiting to have some good steady officers and some grog, and then everything is going to be okay. Which is exactly. <laughs> Whereas Stephen's thinking the whole world is about to go to hell in a handcart and the millennium is coming and we're all doomed and I don't know why I have kids. And, you know, he's a, he's a glass half empty kind of a dude. And uh, Jack Aubrey is absolutely the glass half full part of the partnership here. <laughs> right. Oh. Anyhow, as they're having this little conversation, Lieutenant Yule interrupts them and says, they've opened the strait. He says, it's blowing very hard out and the making tide is coming through hard. So they're now on the far side of the Cape and may opening the strait means they can look backwards up through the, the Western inlet into the Straits of Magellan. The making tide, he says, is carrying damned... Uh, carrying awkward great lumps of ice. And Jack says, it's going to be okay. It'll be slack water soon. They could drop a kedge, drop a, a lightweight anchor to keep them in one place, but keep the breeze right aft so that they can look back through the strait, which is going to be quite the sight, I think. And probably with a certain amount of relief, given that they've managed to traverse the Cape and get to the other side. Stephen then writes to Christine about Mr. Hewell's awkward great lumps of ice as he called them, describing the scene on deck as they look into the strait. He believes that the Ringle, unlike the surprise, would not survive even a glancing blow from any one of these big ice flows. There appears to be no hope, he says, for a canoe that they see trying to cross the tide and navigate past the ice. And looking down in the canoe, Stephen sees a young woman in a piece of sealskin. She's paddling there are half a dozen crouching dogs. There's an older woman, naked, holding up a basket of fish, and also a naked baby. And these are pretty hardy souls going out more or less unclothed in sea strewn with chunks of ice. So it's clearly not the most balmy of conditions. Anyhow, the crew watches as the canoe touches one of these ice floes, and I think they expect the worst, but there's no upset to the canoe. They stay upright and on they come. Unable to pass, finally, the canoe spins round and runs with the current toward the surprise. Captain Aubrey calls down and offers them a rope, but Stephen thinks that the, the, this manoeuvre with the rope might have destroyed the frail canoe. So Bjorn shouts at them. The woman replies in some way. A blanket is thrown down because clearly somebody thinks we need to cover up this chilly, chilly female flesh that's down there. The old woman catches the blanket and smiles and they're swept along the shore. They stop on a stony strand, a beach with a little hovel behind it. There's some smoke from a fire. That means the men must be close by, right? Yes, indeed. There's a naked man walking slowly down, ready for the fish and the dogs and the blanket. So we've got a little illustration in real life of the story that we'd had told before about how in this society, the women take all the risks and do all the work and the men lounge on the beach waiting for the fish and the blankets. Right, right. Well, the tide stills, and Jack sends the Ringle in to look into the pass and report on the state of the ice. And while the Ringle's off doing that, he asks Mr. Hansen and Bjorn to join him in the cabin. Now, working with Hansen, who kind of understands Bjorn's way of speaking and is acting sort of as an interpreter, 
Jack learns that Bjorn speaks the language of these parts. I think Jack had noticed him talking to this woman. And he was like, I, I got to get underneath that. Bjorn had lived there when a former ship had wrecked close by. And Bjorn tells Jack about the tribes in the area, about Wigwam Reach, a sheltered passage sometimes used by the whalers 150 miles past Cabo Pilar into the Pacific. And he says there's some wicked Indians along the way, but a man of war has nothing to fear. So Jack's got a little bit of local intelligence on the area here and somebody who speaks a bit of the language. Bjorn tells him that not every tribe speaks the same thing. And I keep wondering, I keep feeling like I'm playing kind of a, you know, one of those games where you collect things along the way and keep them in your package right. to use later. <laughs> I keep thinking, okay, we've got this, we've got this, we've got this. What, what's O'Brien going to have us use later? So here's another one. Bjorn's local knowledge and way of speaking, and then perhaps this wigwam reach. <sighs> Very good. I, I, I love the idea of a, a Patrick O'Brien novel as one of those old text adventure games that we used to play on computer. You know, pick up branch. Exactly. <laughs> Keep knowledge about Wigwam Reach in back pocket. <laughs> Anyhow, Stephen's back again to his letter. This is a very epistolary little bit of writing that we've got here from Patrick O'Brien. By now... Stephen's writing with the surprise having made it around the far side of the Cape Horn into the Pacific. The horn is long behind them, and Stephen summarizes the situation like this. Captain Aubrey, he says, has decided that duty requires him to waste not a minute in the placid navigation of slow, sheltered waters, but to press on, come tempest, come dreadful ice, come wounded spars and threadbare wounded ropes, and now come the approach of famine. Mm. Our supplies of everything but water are running very, very low. And we remember it was just a few pages ago in this chapter that they might just about have paused long enough to harvest some mussels and do some fishing. They're really, really right down at the low end of their supplies for food here. People in the sick berth are showing the first signs of scurvy. So it's not only food that they're short of, it's fresh food with vitamin C. Three men and a boy have already died of pneumonia, and Mr. Woodbine himself is sinking fast. Stephen's letter goes on. Himself, and by that I mean Jack Aubrey, for he does indeed personify the ship, has become grave, stern, unapproachable. He asks no man's opinion, and I have the impression that he knows exactly what he is doing, that he sails with the same determination and clarity of mind as the great albatrosses that sometimes accompany us black-browed, wandering, and royal. That's really great writing. I love those three adjectives to, to, to personify albatrosses as Jack Aubrey and vice versa. Black-browed, wandering, and royal. That's really, really great. Nice. Well, and Stephen says that even though he's been at sea for a long time, He's still surprised by the way the men short on rations are still working very hard, and they've kept at it for an uncountably long time, all of whom have, he says, no complaints, no short answers, no cursing of an awkward shipmate. He says their gaiety is gone, but their fortitude remains. He says he and Jack still eat together, but have not candidly exchanged their minds for a great while. Yeah. Jack's glad to have found some bottles of Jamaican rum, gifts of the Delaware. And Jack told him, the men will go through hell and high water to save the barky, but if you touch their grog, I should not like to answer for even the best of them. <laughs> mm. So the, the ship's surgeon is worried about low food supplies and low vitamin C. The ship's hands are worried about running out of booze. There's the Navy for you. In a, there you in, a, in a nutshell. Stephen has heard that there's anxiety specifically in the gun room about their dwindling stores, but that this should soon be relieved once they reach this particular small group of islands near the coast. With the Arctic spring likely to be beginning, these islands are probably going to be a good place for them to resupply. And taking up his pen a few days later, Stephen writes that he thought he himself had by now conquered his extreme reluctance towards seeing blood, what with his vocation as a surgeon and his anatomical studies and the life that he's led aboard ship, he's thinking he should have been fairly inured to the sight of blood. But he says, the carnage of the last few days 
sickened him. He goes on to describe the scene. They had taken the blue cutter ashore and seen a delightful number of different penguins, leopard seals, sea elephants, and birds. But a number of the hands who'd sailed in whalers or sealers before started knocking seals on the head and cutting them up for salting. It was, he wrote, an extraordinarily bloody, extraordinarily unpleasant exercise carried out for the most part in a phlegmatic, workaday fashion. It distressed most of the boys extremely. They excited a few others. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't give us very much immediate first-person description of this, but he's really viscerally recording the reaction of Stephen and most of the ship's boys to this kind of bloodlust around the uh, the slaughtering. Ne- necessary because they need the fresh meat, but really, really sickening for somebody who cares about life. Anyhow, the surprises and the ringles holds are now filled with barrels of seal and sea lion flesh, both of them rich and nourishing meats. So nutritionally, we're back in pretty good shape here. But clearly this is coming across for Stephen, and uh, here's what he has to say about it in his letter. I did, however, notice that although the very real fear of running out of provisions in the far South Sea had certainly vanished, yet a certain cloud hung over the ship. It disappeared after grog and an enormous supper of fresh seal steaks. And stupidly, I did not attend to the proportion of those who were affected and those, mostly countrymen and accustomed to killing as a matter of course from childhood, who were not. Yet I did notice, since we were in the same boat, that Hansen and his particular friend Daniel did what little they could to hide their distress in our many bloody voyages to and fro with the skewers screaming just over our heads. End of chapter seven. Wow. (sighs) Wow. It's funny. We've been with Stephen and also quite a lot with Hansen and with the ship's company in in, in a Stephen world and only occasionally looking at the world through Jack Aubrey's eyes. Through Stephen's eyes, this has been a really terrible moment, even though through Jack Aubrey's point of view, it's probably the saving of the ship and her provisions and the, her chances for her onward journey. So uh, it's pretty grim, right, for Stephen to be caught between these two perceptions. I'm, I'm sure he knows for himself in his head that they needed to do this, but his heart is having a hard time with it. Yeah, I, I think it really is. And and just the, um, as you say, in you know, the way O'Brien has kind of put this out here with the skewers screaming over yeah. our heads, you know, the birds are in revolt about this. And these young boys, Hanson and Daniel, who were so close to, you know, really trying to hide their distress. And Jack, in a, in a mirror-like fashion, I think when he was pressing on so bad and grave and didn't want to hear anything, I think it's Jack knowing we're going to run out of food here yeah. and we can't do that. And maybe we'll run out of grog and, oh my gosh, you know, this is not going to be good. And the whole call back to the wager and the mutiny and the, you know, yeah. here we go. This is what happens in tough times here. So yeah, really uh, a tough, tough chapter, but fascinating. And and back to, you know, there's so many lines that you and I both picked out here to go. Yes. Yes. You know, I love the way they were writing this. Love how this is going. Uh, to me, my my immediate takeaway, as soon as I kind of flipped the last page of this chapter was, now this is back to that same combination of o- O'Brien's writing that yeah. I particularly joy. Or maybe it's some combination about me being a little less grumpy and not contrasting <laughs> with this action past fast plotted books that I'd been reading in parallel last chapter. So in this yeah. chapter, the story just seemed to be part of the natural, interesting flow of their journey as O'Brien moves us along the book and along on the journey. Yeah. I've got to say, though, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting more seriously back into Jack Aubrey's point of view here. I think we've, I, I can completely understand why we are with the perspective of Stephen Maturin for all the reasons that we all know about. But I think there's some serious business to be done with the ship and seamanship and navigation and the, the, the whole naval affair that's coming up with Chile here. So, I'm really, really looking forward to the possibility that we might get more, as you might say, back with Jack in the coming chapters. Even so, I'm not for a minute saying that I'm not enjoying the Stephen's letter to Christine with all of the nice little 
partly romantic, partly longing, partly wistful, partly nerdy reflections that come in with that. Yeah, and, and I think even O'Brien is kind of signaling us that it's it's going to be important to get back to Jack. I mean, we yeah. had we started the chapter with, uh oh, look at the asp. Not only is Lindsay a worthy adversary, but we've got this ship completely rebuilt, completely rearmed. Jack looking graver and graver about everything in yeah. this thing. And then, as you say, this ongoing letter to Christine, a lot of it, Stephen's viewpoint about Jack and how important. Yeah. The influence of the captain is on the ship, on her crew. I keep reminding myself in the background that while Jack is reacting to all these things around him, we've also clearly got this whole thing about being flag sick yeah. that's running through. And, and I keep reminding myself, this this book is called Blue at the Mizzen. Yeah. You know, what's going on with all that? So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Well, that, that's something. Mm, let's just call that an interesting piece of foreshadowing to pick up in the next chapter but we seem to have overcome the worst of the weather and the navigational hazards i I guess i mean mike i'm thinking back to hms surprise and desolation island and all these other voyages where we've had multiple chapters of really grave peril at sea and terrible things to recover from and terrible feats of improvisation and seamanship and so far touch a belaying pin it seems like we're through the storms we're in the pacific and Jack's got the chance to to just keep keep going. He's cracking on. We're not wasting a minute. It's true that we're low on supplies and scurvy's breaking out, but we seem to have the chance now to put our foot down and head for Chile. I don't know quite how it was that we came to be so low on supplies when we had the options of touching at Rio. I don't know quite why we're so low on grog either, but it, it, it's clear that there's meant to be this sort of drumbeat of uncertainty and doubt and potential danger for jack and the crew it's a shame though that that re- that comes at the cost of this terrible carnage that hansen and daniel and stephen of course had to witness you kind of wonder then what 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 does all this foreboding and all this apprehension foretell for the next chapter no i'm i'm completely with you and we've had so much like okay it's really bad but it's working out but it's bad but but it's working yeah. out. But boy, this this isn't so good here. And and I keep thinking, and it's important to the captain. And as you say, we're not seeing stuff so much through Jack's eyes, and he's you know, kind of removed and grave and everything. So you know, I'm going to be really interested. Are we going to catch up with David Lindsay? Are we going to see this right. contrast between the two of them? And with three chapters left in the book, I'm really looking forward to learning what happens, what happens next. And I, I guess there's only one way for it, huh? Right. What do you say, Ian, next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart. <laughs> nickname was fair weather jeff sorry <laughs> foul weather jack right not fair weather jack yeah so it's foul weather jack this is foul weather it may be sailing with fair weather jack who knows anyways that as a midshipman jack had known admiral byron